Through many lives I've drunk the cup of laughter No man could tell the pleasures I have known The stars in the endless sky If one could count would come to billions Yet as vast as are their numbers, far from you. Yet as vast as are their numbers, so many years. I've wandered far from you Through many lives I've drunk the cup of sorrow No man could tell the bitter tears I've shed The drops in the endless sea if one could count, would come to billions. Yet as vast as are their numbers, so many years 
I've wandered far from you. Yet as vast as are their numbers, so many years I've wandered far from you. Through countless lives, I've sought your cup of sweetness, found other cups, yet thirsted evermore. The streams in the hills of time all found their way into a desert. Every noon of bright fulfillment, ere many hours did sink to evening gloom. Every noon of bright fulfillment, ere many hours did sink to evening gloom. I long for you in summer and in winter, only for you my heart thirsts day and night. I've learned that the sweetest songs ears ever heard were but your echo. Lord, at last fill me completely For never more I'd wander far from you. Lord, at last fill me completely. For never more I'd wander far from you. Thank you, Chaitanya. That was a perfect way to begin. So good morning, everyone. Nice to get together again, and welcome to our friends on the internet who are watching us as well. Really, that song that Chaitanya just sang, Through Many Lives, we could just start meditating, and that would teach us everything we needed to know about our topic this morning. Uh, what we're talking about today, the topic is life. <laughs> Falling back, milling around, or making progress. And just as yesterday when we were talking about birth, we kind of took a little step backward and talked about death. So we talk about life today. I also want to take a little step backward and talk about birth and how that influences our consciousness in this life. There's a story that Swamiji has shared with us over the years about an allegory about how God produced creation, how it was manifest. And it started out that God was just pure consciousness, and he wanted to enjoy himself through many. Or as Swami has refined the concept more recently, he wanted to expand his awareness of bliss. And so he created 
all of us, all human beings. He created souls and he sent them out. But they were perfect. And being perfect, they sat down to meditate and they realized, what am I doing here? And they just merged back into God and the whole show came to an end. And God said, hmm, that didn't work so well. And so he tried the whole thing again. And he sent forth myriads of created beings. And they looked around, enjoyed the beauties of this world briefly, and then sat and meditated and said, oh, that was nice. Let's go home. And they merged back into God again. And then God said, hmm, we've got to do something different this time. And so as Swami has put it over the years very well, he said, God made a decision which has had very interesting ramifications for all of us. <laughs> He decided to create maya, delusion, the force that makes us think that we're separate from God. And he created all the beings. He covered us all with this veil of delusion. And we looked around and we said, wow, this looks like fun. <laughs> and there we were. And it begins this process over and over. And that's why Master's call, this very interesting. He said, the process of reincarnation is created by the satanic force to keep us deluded into the, in the consciousness that this world will bring us fulfillment and to want us, help us to, or to inhibit us from understanding that the kingdom of God, the awareness of God's presence within us, is the kingdom of fulfillment. And so this process of reincarnation, Master calls it a satanic force, not in the sense of evil. You know, you look at the movies that are out there these days, and my goodness, <laughs> what an imagination those people have. But <clears throat> not in the sense of, you know, people with horns and, and fangs and all that but in the sense that it separates us from the consciousness of unity with God. And so we come back again and again. I remember hearing about some uh, form of movie that was popular, I think it was in the 40s, for children's matinees, and it was called Cliffhangers. And would keep the kids coming back every Saturday afternoon, and it was like the hero would be just about to be run over by the train, and then it said, come back next week. Or the hero would be just about to conquer the bad guy, come back again next week. And so really, we can think of reincar the reincarnational process as like a cliffhanger. It's like, oh, I almost did it, and then it was over. Oh, gee, we'll have to come back next Saturday, or next <laughs> yuga, or whatever it is. And we come back again and again. And because it's, it's exciting, and I mean, we have to admit it's exciting. You know, it's like, who's going to win the Super Bowl? There's a degree of excitement in that. And so we come back again and again. And we, what finally begins to end this process is what Master calls, of course, an anguishing sense of monotony. How many times have I done this? How many times have I had to learn to read and to write and to tie my shoes? I know when our son was in high school and we would drop him off, it was a very strong spiritual impetus for me because I thought, I never want to have to go to high school again. Please, Lord, <laughs> I'll do anything. <laughs> just tell me what to do, and I'll do it, just so I don't have to go back to high school again. But in a very interesting talk that Master gives, and it, it's, one of, it, it's one of his more sober ones, he talks about the great struggle of life. And that struggle begins in the astral world, as Jyotish was talking about yesterday, when he was talking about when there's uh, a couple has conceived a child, then there's a rush in the astral world. And so th that's the initial struggle, to get through, to break out of the regions of light and formlessness, and to fight off the other competing souls, and to enter that mother's body. You know, there was a friend of mine who's a devotee was telling me recently that 
her, she has a grown son, but when he was little, he was having a, uh, a tantrum and she was yeah. disciplining him. And then after a while, he kind of calmed down and he came out of his room and he looked at her and he said, you weren't even my first choice as a mother. <laughs> And, and she kind of looked at him because she, she knew these teachings and she said, oh really, well who was your first choice? And she said, it was a lady in the Philippines but she wasn't available. <laughs> so anyway, that, there's the initial struggle even to get into this world. And then Master says, amazingly, he said, I transported my consciousness into the prenatal state to see what it was like. And he said, from the first moment where that we have consciousness in the womb, we think, what have I done? <laughs> I left the world of formlessness to get into this form. And Master said, if there is any purgatory, for those of you who have, um, you know, oh, the romance of the, you know, the woman carrying a child and all that maternity, and he, Master said, if there is any purgatory, it is the time that the soul spends in the womb because they are trapped. He said they have to breathe through somebody else and eat through somebody else and the blood flows to them through somebody else. They can't move. They remember past lives and then they struggle against it. And he said, they're just crying, Lord, free me. And he said, premature babies are those with strong wills who just say, I can't take this anymore. I am getting out. <laughs> and so he said it's a time of great struggle and so the initial struggle first getting there and then realizing the choice we've made and then the struggle between the desire to be in a form and the desire for formlessness and he said it's an intensely difficult time but then when the baby is born he said with the first breath he said, until that time, the soul is within the, the body, but it's in a semi-dormant state. But with the first breath, it becomes an independent life. And the veil of Maya comes over it. And so the struggling of, why am I doing this, begins to subside a little bit. And, you know, we think, oh, the, we, personal account, we uh, went and saw our beautiful little new grandson yesterday afternoon. Lincoln Christopher Novak, very pretty name. But you know, he was beautiful, he was beautiful. But as it, the poet, I believe Wordsworth said, we come trailing clouds of glory. But we also come trailing lots of other things. And <laughs> Master said that once someone handed him a, a little newborn baby and he said, I almost dropped it because I looked and I saw that that soul had been a murderer in a, his previous incarnation. So here the soul finds itself and then that sense of independent life begins. We accept the karma, but then the struggle doesn't end. The struggle continues and Master really describes in this particular talk, which I was reading, he just, I mean, life is a, it's beautiful quote from Metaphysical Meditations. Life is a struggle for joy every step of the way. May I win that battle on the very spot upon which I now stand. And so if we think of life as anything else, we really will not have the motivation to give it our all on the spiritual path. So then the struggle begins, and Jatish will talk more specifically about this later, the struggle to conquer our body, to be able to use it, to walk, the struggle to uh, control our emotions and our will and to develop our intellect and all these different things. And each one has its own process that we have to learn. And Jatisha, as I say, we'll talk more about that later. But then we also come up against the more intense struggles. And these are the struggles of our own karma of habits, environment, ill health, all of these things. And we are so fortunate because our guru gave us specific techniques for every one of these things. He talks about 
dealing with ill health and disease. And I always feel uh, it's necessary to say, because people think, um, oh, well, you know, you're a yogi, you should be in perfect health, you should be able to conquer all, because these are our teachings. Well, I recently looked at a medical report of Swamiji. It was astonishing. It was like he could be, if he was a doctor's only patient, they could learn everything they needed about every disease. <laughs> And Peter shaking his head. I remember Peter saying once that Swami was, of all his five, 6,000 patients, Swami was the most complex. But does he not know the teachings? Does he not practice the teachings? <coughs> there are other forces at work, so I do wanna say that. But nevertheless, Master teaches us that in this struggle of life, we are surrounded by disease and bacteria and germs and, and, and resistant germs and increase, you know, this increasing crescendo. And Jyotish was telling us recently that <clears throat> when they do research in the human body, there are more foreign cells in our body than what we would call our own body cells. So bacteria and things like that. So who are we? You know, where a part of me is this body, but a greater part of me is the bacteria I've just picked up in India. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's an astonishing fact. And we are bombarded all the time by all these forces. And sometimes we <laughs> succumb. But the lovely challenge is to use, as Master said, the power of the mind to conquer disease. Will we always succeed? No. Will we live forever in this body? No. But we can try. And that's the beauty of it. If Master said at the point of death, if you are being ravaged by disease, if you affirm, I am well, you will go into your next life with a strong, healthy body. So the process of dealing with poor health and not being identified with it. We were reading an interesting article about the placebo effect, which you know, you've all heard about, but Peter, I'll probably get this all wrong. You can tell me how wrong I got it later. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but what, what doctors are starting to realize is they're not only prescribing placebos and having very, very good results, but they're telling patients this is a placebo and they're still having good results. <laughs> and so what is it? It's the power of the mind. You know, when we were in India recently and we weren't feeling very well, I, my, my medicine of choice is little white bear aspirin. And that's all I wanted was a little white bear aspirin and we didn't have any. And I, they gave me the Indian version, which was very weird. And I thought, no, that's not the aspirin that I know works for me. And finally, Leela had some aspirin and she gave them to me. And I said, now I can get better. And I did. <laughs> and, but the power of the mind is so important. And you know, in a community of expansive, creative people such as Ananda is, we will be introduced to hundreds of healing modalities and, and herbs and tinctures and all that sort of thing. And you know why they work? Because we believe they do while they'll work for one person and they won't work for another. Simply, if you give it your belief. I finally figured that one out. I thought, wow, that really works for her because she believes in it. And so whatever you do to keep your body healthy and whole, find what you believe in and then do it. And don't, I, I don't proselytize because it may not work for somebody else because they may believe in something else. So it's really the power of the mind that cures us of illness and ill health. And this is one of the struggles that Master talks about, is the, the struggle that we face of the invasion of disease. And it's something we all have to deal with one way or another. Um, Swami does it so gracefully, so gracefully. It's just amazing to watch him. Um, <clears throat> there was, uh, he gave a satsang, I'll tell more about that later. But um, 
in the last Sunday we were in uh, Pune and in yes Pune and uh, he could barely walk. You know they really almost had to carry him back to his house, but he just gave this beautiful, beautiful radiant satsang, and um, I shared this with some of you, but. Then and the Indians are so, I mean, they love spirituality the way we in the West love new technology. You know, I mean, they, they just, you can't hold them off. And so they finally got Swamiji back to his house and he sort of collapsed in the chair and then kind of the door burst open and there were these three little Indian, elderly Indian ladies and it was like an older quite elderly mother and two older daughters, and they didn't speak any English, but they just wanted to kiss his feet. That's all they wanted. And they kind of elbowed through all the bodyguards, <laughs> you know, and, and they, that's all they wanted, and then they left. It was so beautiful. And, and Swami, at first when he saw them coming in, I saw this look come on his face like, I don't have any energy left to give, but then, then he, he just became radiant, and that's the process you see, the mind saying, I have something more to give because it's God that flows through me. And then it was so dear because afterwards, then they laughed and I saw them later, these three ladies at the um, dining area. And I just thought they were so dear. So I went up to the older mother and I just gave her a hug. And, and one daughter spoke a little bit of English. And so she said, name, name. And I said, Davy. And she said, where live? And I said, California. And they were, oh, California, cousin California, Pooja Banerjee, find Pooja Banerjee in California. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said, okay, I'll look for her. So if anybody know, finds anybody named Pooja Banerjee, just <laughs> tell her hello from Davy. <laughs> but then we also have to deal with our, the, Health of, and disease, of course, are part of our karma. But then here we are in this life, and how do we work our way through it? Through all the complexities of what we've brought into this life, the relationships, the jobs, the things we've set in motion, all the things. And Master talks about different ways to work through our karma. He said one very, very important way is through self-analysis and introspection. And I really give all of you this, um, let's call it a assignment that you can do personally. And Master suggests that you take time, meditate, and then try to write down your earliest memories, your earliest impressions, because that'll be drawing on what you brought into this life. And then also write down repeated reoccurring challenges that you have had and try to see if they form themselves into some kind of a pattern. Remember that man in, um, <laughs> people are going, oh, and they're nodding. <laughs> Remember, uh, I believe it was Norman, one of Swamiji's brother monks who left Mount Washington because there was a man who he just couldn't get along with. And then after some time he came back to visit and he talked with Swami and he said, Remember, I left because I couldn't get along with this fellow. Well, where I'm working now, there are seven guys just <laughs> like him. And so you can't run away from it. If you see these reoccurring things that you react to, that get you in trouble, that cause you disharmony with other people, whatever it may be, write those down and begin looking at that and saying, where is that coming from in my consciousness? And then, most important, Think, what can I do about it? How can I change these tendencies that I, and not just theoretical, like, oh, I want to be a better person, but very specific. For example, if you have a, a problem of um, reacting, if somebody, uh, it, it be, in becoming impatient, if somebody's slow and you want things to be moving faster, and it's a reoccurring thing, and you can feel it. It makes your heart beat faster. Your, you know, that expression you see red. Well, it's because the heart's beating faster. There's more blood coming there, and so if there are things like that, very specifically, how can I deal with being impatient? Take ten breaths. 
Um, think of the, what, the goodness of having to have a little pause where you can think about God, whatever it might be, but come up with specific analytical tools so that when you find yourself in that reoccurring karmic situation, you say, ah, I have a tool in my tool belt. I know what to do about that. And so you can work with that. And Master said, by introspection and perfect self-honesty, it's so important. Oh, that's really not my problem. You know, it happens now and then, but you know, it's not a big problem. It is a big problem. <laughs> Anything that takes you out of a state of peace and harmony with God is something you need to look at. And it's why it's the difference between milling around and making progress. That perfect self-honesty and then the dynamic follow-through to really act on what you see are the problems that you've come up, you've come into this life with. And we all have them. And when we look at our karma, it's so important not to blame anybody else. Remember, perfect self-honesty. Everything of a difficult nature that's come into our life, we set that in motion. But we shouldn't blame ourselves because of it. That, has, that accomplishes nothing. There was, Swami said he read a book about a woman uh, who had been a nun who had an out-of-the-body experience, a near-death experience, and she went to, um, no, excuse me, she was not a nun. She was just a, a woman who, had, um, who died, but then was returned to earth. But she went to, she had listened to a lot of rock and roll music in her life. So she went to kind of a lower astral world and where that was a predominant vibration. And, but as she looked around in these lower astral regions, she was very surprised because she saw many people who were nuns and monks. And she thought, what are they doing here? And the reason they were there is because they were blaming themselves. Oh, I was such a bad person. Oh, I didn't do 20 Ave Marias. Oh, I didn't go to Mass that day. And, and you know, in comparison to most people's lives, they led exemplary lives. But because they were blaming themselves, I'm a terrible person, and died with that thought, that's where they went. Not for a long time, because they had good karma, and the good karma would pull them out of that. But that's also why Swamiji said when over the years when people have come to him with serious illnesses or terminal illnesses, he said, do not identify with the fact that you have cancer or AIDS or whatever it might be. He said, do what you need, not to be in denial. Do what is needful. Go, you know, do whatever you think is going to medically or alternatively, med alternative medically is going to help you, but don't identify with it. And that frees you from the part of the hold that it has on you. Well, the same with our bad karma. If you've come into life and had to, even as a child perhaps, have had to experience many difficult things, just don't identify. Say, I had to go through this. It was some debt I was paying off, but it does not define who I am. And I've known a number of people who have come through, who are the most inspiring people I know, who have come through horrendous childhoods. And they just had enough strength and willpower to say, this does not define this lifetime for me. And so to, with that perfect self-honesty, looking at your karma, taking responsibility for it, and not blaming others, but, and not blaming yourself, not accusing others, not accusing yourself, but just being practical, being analytical so that you can say, okay, what can I do so this doesn't happen again? I I'm, I'm really want to be done with this. And it's, it be, can become such a beautiful process as you watch people becoming free. And it's one of the joys in living in community all these years because there's not a person that I know who hasn't made tr very evident changes in their lives, that each one becomes more transparent, more radiant, more free. Free is the operative word, and that's the promise of the gurus. 
Now, so to use our, to be self-honest, perfectly honest, to use dynamic willpower so that we're not falling back or milling around but making progress, but then also to remember the great, great importance of the grace of God and Guru in helping us to achieve freedom. We were, when we were in India uh, at this last satsang that I mentioned, uh, someone asked Swamiji the question, what have you done to achieve enlightenment? And you know, perfect self-honesty. There Swami is, 250 people, and he said, well, I don't know that I have achieved enlightenment, but I'll tell you what my path to God has been. It's been Guru Seva, Guru Bhakti, and meditation. Service of the Guru, devotion to the Guru, and meditation. And it, it was such a beautiful answer. And then afterwards, we, helped, we went to his house with him before the little ladies broke in. And um, we were sitting there, and I said to him, Swami, I was a little, sometimes when you're in a very uplifted state, you say things that you wouldn't say if you were more in a kind of a state of normal awareness, <laughs> I might say. <laughs> and I just felt a little presumptuous, but I couldn't help it. And I just said, Swamiji, I don't know about enlightenment, but I know just watching you and how you, your consciousness, you're free. And he smiled and he said, yes, I am free. He said, God, Master said, God would not come to me, to me till the end of life, till death, but I am free. And it was so beautiful. And, you know, as we, as we were talking about birth and the struggle that the child comes into, and when a child is born, all of us rejoice, but the child grieves, the soul grieves, because it knows what lies ahead of us. And conversely, we'll talk about this tomorrow, at death, everyone grieves, <laughs> but the soul rejoices. And so that's why, you know, in the Gita it says, what's day to the worldly man is night to the yogi, what's night to the yogi is day to the worldly man. And so we need to understand that a soul that has come into that final stage of life who has worked out the karma and can say, I am free. What, how can we grieve when he dies? Because we know. I mean, we'll grieve for our own loss, of course, but we can't grieve for him. We can only rejoice. And similarly with our own karma, as we work through it, Whatever the struggle takes, it's, it's just sort of like picking burrs out of your clothes, you know? And really, if we can do it as impersonally as that, we've walked in the meadow, we've had a beautiful experience, <laughs> we've walked through lifetimes, we've learned much through many lives, who knows the, the countless pleasures, the countless sorrows we have seen, but now, Lord, all I want is you. And if we can walk through that life and then look down and say, oh, I've gotten some burrs in this lifetime. I have some attachments and desires and wrong attitudes. Let me work on getting rid of these with honesty and self-effort. And then I'll be able to be perfectly free and be free of the karma. Master also stresses how important meditation is for b helping us to work through our karma. And, and in a way you think, well, why would that be? Because Karma means action, so don't you have to act to expiate your karma? But not really, because Master says sitting in deep silence is the best way to expiate your karma. Because, again, we are not identifying with our external life, with our good things and bad things, but we are only identifying with our soul nature in deep meditation. And so it's very, very, remember yesterday we were talking about meditate as though you're building a bridge to the astral world? 
Well, in this wonderful week together, when we're having the opportunity to have longer meditations, also try to meditate. When you begin feeling, oh, I'm going to just let all this world go and then go into the astral world, meditate on freedom. Meditate on freedom from all karma. If you can dwell in that consciousness for even a moment, it will change your life because the hold of karma will, will begin to loosen on you. And you can say, as Jyotish was using the illustration, pulling the plug on it yesterday, pulling the plug on a fan, the wheels still spin a bit, but the blades of the fan still spin, but there's nothing feeding it. So in this week, let's all of us try to meditate on inner freedom, that nothing can hold me. This life is not about milling around. This life is not about, certainly not about falling back, but this life is about making the dash for freedom, as Master said. And then finally, I, let me take a drink of water here. I wanted to share with you one last story that happened when we were in India with Swamiji. Um, Yuswami has just completed a very beautiful novel, which will be coming out later in the year, called um, A Pilgrimage to Guadalupe. Is there a subtitle? Okay. Anyway. Okay. Anyway. And, and it's, about a, it's about a soul man going on a journey to the shrine at Guadalupe where the children had uh, a vision of, uh, several children in Mexico had a vision of a beautiful young radiant woman, girl, one might say. And you know, some years ago, about four years ago, Swamiji took a pilgrimage to Medjugorje in Czechoslovakia and he went to, he got to meet one of the three, uh, I think it was four children who would have these daily visions. Uh, and he got to meet Vika, one of the women, who's, you know, a middle-aged woman now. Or, uh, and there he's got a picture of, beautiful photo of Swamiji and Vika when he went, and she, he, he got to meet her privately. And they just look like two children of God, just mm -hmm. radiant, radiant, beautiful faces. And so we were sitting in his house, and I noticed on the wall there was like a silver bas-relief. I don't think it was solid silver, but maybe silver-plated. And it had a beautiful young woman, young girl's face, and then like a cathedral in the background. And I asked Swamiji, I said, what is that? And he said, oh, we got that in Medjugorje. And then I began thinking, and I thought, isn't it interesting how in Fatima, in Portugal, in uh, Gorbandal, which is in remote Spain, in Guadalupe, in um, Mexico, and did I say, uh, there's four of them. Lourdes? Well, Lourdes, no, the Guadalupe, Medjugorje, Guadalupe, Fatima, and Gorbandal, and, and then Lourdes too, of course. How there was a group of young children little boys and girls, <coughs> usually peasants, usually uneducated, same as Joan of Arc. I just finished reading a wonderful book about her life. And how they all would have these very pure children, and they would have the vision of this lovely young girl. And that's how God came to them. And it's happened repeatedly in our lifetime, you know, in, in these... <laughs> <laughs> Since the Second World War, uh, Guadalupe was before that. But I said to Swamiji, isn't it beautiful how God appears as a young girl to these children and it's happened repeatedly throughout the world? And he said, yes. He said, that's the sweetest relationship with God of a companion, a friend, not awe, but just a simple playmate. He said, that's why my favorite poem of Masters is, it's called I Am Here, and it ends with, hello, what God's saying to the devotee, hello, playmate, I am here. And, and Swami just looked beatific, and he just said, that's how I relate to God, just as my playmate. 
And so for all of us, I, I'll let Joe Tish speak now, but invite him to speak now. But um, <laughs> I set you up for that, you know, I didn't have to, <laughs> I had to go there. Anyway, um, just when we're, we come into this life and Master describes the intensity of the struggle from, from before we enter the womb, in the womb, after birth, throughout this life, to the moment of death, but through it all, if we can have that childlike openness to say, God, you are my playmate. I am here. With you, the struggle is not hard. I will do the best I can. And at the end, I will go out no more. So God bless you.